Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, Dota Birds, Leaky Black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button like you're Brandon Davies. You have consent. You haven't if you haven't yet subscribed to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel, also do that while you're here. Let's get into it. Today we are continuing. Our summer shoot around series that we're going to be doing over a seven week span. We've already published episodes on Arizona, Arkansas, Baylor, Yukon, Creighton, Duke, and Florida Atlantic. We're working in alphabetical order. So now we're turning our attention to Gonzaga. The Zags were 31 and six overall last season, went 14 and two in the West Coast Conference, shared the league title with St. Mary's, won the league tournament, got a three seed in the NCAA tournament, beat Grand Canyon, TCU, and UCLA to advance to the Elite Eight. Then they got blasted by UConn, 82-54. Four of the top five scorers from that team are gone, including Drew Timmy and Julian Strother. But Anton Watson is back. Nolan Hickman is back. And the Zags added a herald of transfers in Ryan Nimhard and Graham E.K., plus Steel Venters. This guy is why I've got Gonzaga ranked 19th in the top 25 and one. We'll see what Norlander thinks about that next. But first, a word from our partners. And how about this? Get ready for non-stop action that will have you say, you got to be kidding. Oh, my, Canada. Mr. Case thinks what a play and what a finish. That's a pretty good football, eh? He's gone all the way to the house. It's the Canadian Football League, Thursday on CBS Sports Network. All right, dead leg Gonzaga as a preseason top 20 team. Do you respect it? There we go. Or do you reject it? Okay, now we're cooking. There we go. Now we're spicing it up. Do you know how hard it is to sit around and try to think of those? I, I can I can get them to you by the end of the night. Give so. me a give me a slew. I need a slew. You do need a slew of them. Uh, I respect it, I, I, partly because of what Gonzaga's history is here. Now, I was thinking about this heading into this this taping. There have been off seasons in the past, you know, ten to fifteen years where Gonzaga has had significant turnover and some skepticism over how good the program might be from a top 15 ish, top 20 perspective. And, you know, pretty much every single season uh, the program has gone and exceeded that. I mean, if you go back and look to 2011, 2012, and since then uh, the program has finished inside the top 20, all except three seasons and the three seasons that it didn't 2011, 2012, it was 21 in 13 14, it was 24th at Ken Palm. In 15 16, it was also 21st. It has been within the top 10 for the past seven seasons running. Um, I do think we are going to have Gonzaga take a step back this season. I'll let GP run down the roster here in just one quick second. But I think because of the freshmen coming in, you lose one of the three greatest players in program history and drew Timmy Strother was obviously a very important piece. Um, some transfers who are good transfers. And uh, honestly, the transfers are why Gonzaga is even getting an episode and are as a preseason top 25 team for GP. But, uh, and Mark fuel, they'll probably figure it out. Like they're going to be the best team in the WCC again. Sure. Um, but I, I, I do wonder if this is actually going to be the first year in a good while where Gonzaga is a, good team or a pretty good team, but not a great team because it has been on the level of a great team for a number of years. And that has been validated with standings and predictive metrics and obviously seeding into the tournament and making runs uh, into the final four deep into the the NCAAs. I mean, it just a season ago, it made it to the elite eight. And then like everyone else that faced the Huskies, it just got absolutely (laughs) demolished. But on the whole, it was a good season. What are your thoughts on Gonzaga and, um, what uh, what do people need to know about this roster? Because I think it is going to be a situation where you might know one or two faces, but uh, there's a lot of dudes on this on this team that I think casual college basketball fans might not be familiar with. Yeah, like when's the last time Gonzaga didn't? This could be easily looked up. Probably something. If I knew I was going to think about this, I would have looked it up before we started. But it. like, when does the last time Gonzaga doesn't return somebody who is, you know, obviously an all American level guy or first team, all conference level guy. I think this is the least impressive 
Gonzaga roster in terms of returning players that we've had in a while, but the additions they've made through the transfer market still make it, you know, a borderline top 20 team. I've got the Zags 19th in the top 25 and one only other West coast conference team I have in there is obviously St. Mary's at 21 Bart Torvik. Uh, for what it's worth, has Gonzaga 11th in the preseason and St. Mary's 14th. So same order, but a little higher at Torvik than I have them in the top 25 and one. And for what it's worth, West Coast Conference, no other teams in the top 100 at BartTorvik.com. So it's Gonzaga, St. Mary's, big gap, and then San Francisco coming in third at 112th. Like you mentioned with the history, Gonzaga's been number one at Kimpom three of the past seven years, top 10 at Kimpom seven straight years. Hadn't finished outside of the top 25 at Ken Palm since 2011. I, I do think all of that stuff is at risk this season, although I still think this team should be good and an obvious uh, conference champion and an NCAA tournament team. As for the roster, the returning guys, it's Nolan Hickman and Tom Watson. Those are the two big ones. Uh, they were both role players last season. Hickman averaged 7.7 points, 3.1 assists, 2.4 rebounds. Shot 35.4% from three on 3.5 attempts per game. Started 36 times last season. He's a former top 50 prospect, class of 2021, but he hasn't really broken through. I think last, I think some people Agreed. thought last season would be the breakthrough, um, and it just didn't really happen. Uh, they could sure use that this season. Uh, Anti Watson, six foot eight, fifth year player. Average 11 points, six rebounds, 2.4 assists, 1.8 steals. They like really filled up the, the stat sheet pretty good. Um, he's not really a stretch option at the four if we have him slotted to start at the four. Mm -hmm. uh, he only took 1.3 three-pointers uh, per game last season. So the Zags will have a pretty traditional uh, front court with Anton Watson at the four and presumably Graham E.K. at the five. This is the – I know Nimharb is the more heralded transfer. EK was great two years ago. And we'll just see what he is now. But he's six foot nine. He's a third year player. Missed all of last season with a right foot injury. But back in 2022, as a sophomore, um, he averaged 19 and a half points, 9.6 rebounds um, for uh, a, a Wyoming team that, that made the NCAA tournament. He was last season's preseason Mountain West Conference player of the year and then just never played. So he's a little bit out of sight, out of mind. But if he can go back to what he was two weeks ago, um, yes. It's two definitely. weeks ago. <laughs> well, maybe he was awesome two weeks ago. I think he, he went was two awesome. years ago. He was awesome two years ago, probably also awesome two weeks ago. If he can go back to either one of those things, he's going to be fine. Um, Nimhard, uh, obviously the transfer from Creighton, six-foot lead guard, third-year player, 12 points, five assists, 35.6% from three last season. He has started 64 games the past two years at Creighton. I think Creighton did a nice job replacing him, but he's a big loss and a big addition for the Zags. And then I think the starting lineup is rounded out with Steel Venters, who a six foot seven, fourth year player, um, Eastern Washington, averaged 15 points, 2.8 rebounds, shot 37% from three on 6.2 attempts per game. He's a career 40% three point shooter. So last season was actually the first time he's ever shot below 41.4%. He's an accomplished and reliable threat from the perimeter, that's a pretty good starting lineup. I don't know that it has the star power that a Drew Timmy starting lineup might have or some of these other um, great Zags teams we've seen over the years, but that's uh, that looks like a that looks like an obvious top 25 team to me. Yeah, it should be. So Watson um, got to get a little bit better. I think he probably will. Nemhard, if he continues on his trajectory, that's going to be massive. His brother, of course, played there. We talked about that earlier in the offseason. Hickman has to have a big-time breakout season. We'll see if he does. And by has to, I mean, Gonzaga's not going to be a top-10 team if Nolan Hickman doesn't eventually have that huge season. We'll see if he can develop in that. We'll see if Nemhard coming aboard actually helps facilitates that or, um, or doesn't. EK, yes. We're going to bank on him being an impact player. Gonzaga's had some good success with transfers, but there have been some misses. And then I think Venters will be that, uh, the fifth starter, if you will, but he's not, he doesn't play the five. He'll be in the three spot. If it's not him, it'll probably be freshman dusty Stromer, which by the way, steel Venters and dusty Stromer, <laughs> steel Venters, dusty Stromer straight out of a 1977 cop show. If these guys don't follow in the lineage of drew Timmy, and show up with matching mustaches 
at some point this season, then Gonzaga will have entirely lost the plot. Steel Venters, Dusty Stromer, get it done. Stromer's a uh, top 60 small forward, 6'6", 180 pounds. And um, if he doesn't start, and I don't think you, I think he'll be the first guy off the bench. And then there's Marcus Adams, the Kansas, the one-time Kansas commit, who is uh, who is now with Gonzaga. So that could potentially be a, a big-time pickup at the wing. We'll see what his impact is this season. And then... Depth is a is a question here. Ben Gregg got some burn. He'll get some more. We'll see how much he plays. And then Caden Perry's, you know, he should step up as as well this season. But to me, it comes down to Nemhard. Does he become or stay? If you think he was already there as a top five lead guard in the country, I think there's a great chance for that. And then can Hickman as well make the jump? I know Gonzaga fans are are waiting for that, and pr- pr- maybe it does happen. But I will say this. Gonzaga preseason wise. So it's not going to be top 10 in the preseason. That'll be the first time in uh, since the 17, 18 season when they were coming off their run to the title game. Um, but if they're not top 15, which they might not be, that has not happened for Gonzaga outside of the 17, 18 season since all the way back in 2012, 2013. So this program is accustomed to entering the season top 10 in the preseason poll. And if not, there's been a couple of times where they've been in that 11 to 15 range. They haven't been outside the top 20 in a good while. We'll see if it happens this year or not, but outside the top 15 probably seems likely. And don't doubt Mark few, this team has averaged more wins per season over the past eight years, maybe even longer than that. I did that, um, that trivia time on an earlier summer shoot around. Uh, I don't think 30 wins is reasonable for this team this season, uh, even with a uh, postseason in- included, they can get there, but uh, I think Gonzaga and uh, appropriately. So is going to be uh, considered a notch blow. And you'll remember a year ago, it was this a season ago, I should say it was considered a good thing that Gonzaga didn't have this huge target on its back. It wasn't going to get the one seed. It got, you know, it wasn't going to be like they're the big team to watch out for. They wound up playing up to seed expectations. They made the Elite Eight. They had the best offense in the country and, um, you know, was a, top, was a clear-cut uh, per, points per possession top 10 team in the, in the nation. But uh, I think Nemar is the most important player, and I'm interested to see what few and his staff uh, get out of this group that will have a pretty decently wide range for – I'll get the win totals in a second, GP. But I, I'd put it like like – 27 probably feels like the max for this group. And I, if you, if you told me it was actually down around 21 overall, I'd buy that too. You have suggested that you believe Gonzaga's national championship window has passed. Do you still mm-hmm. believe that? Uh, well, and in, in the here and now, doesn't it feel like that might be the case, but we'll see. I mean, as we taught and we, we pre-tape our summer shoot around episode. So full transparency, we are taping this on Tuesday afternoon. We actually don't have the, uh, the latest here on what's going to be happening with the PAC 12 and the big 12, but Gonzaga has been a consistent program that has been flirted with by the big 12. I think Brett Yarmark is intrigued by that. I think Mark few is intrigued, although the big 12 isn't, isn't it's only necessary necessarily it's only option there. I bring that up to say um, I'm not sure if leaving the conference enhances or decreases Gonzaga's chances at having another legitimate window to win a national championship. I would never say it's all the way closed. I just believe that the past few years was the, the widest lane to drive through for Gonzaga. And now I think that is now passed by Mark. Few's a very, very good, good coach. They could get there, but there is, there is a real chance that, that their best window has now passed and, uh, and they might get another chance, but over a sustained two, three, four year period, I think that is now gone. I think both things can be true. It might be true that their best window has passed. I mean, they were number one at Ken Palm three of the past seven years. All right. Yeah. They were undefeated playing in a national championship game. Mm-hmm. It is pos- they, they were in a one possession game in the final minutes of another national championship game. They might not ever get that close again, right? They might not ever play in a championship game again. So it's possible that their best window is passed, but I still think it's possible that they could, with the way people roster build now year to year, of course, you don't have to see it coming. It can all happen in a span of a few weeks in June. You can build a national championship team. And I will never put that past Gonzaga, like that they can just – it, you, you, it used to be like you build it and you can sort of see it and like, oh boy, if these guys come back, then I don't think it'll be like that. If they go win one or, or clearly establish themselves as the favorite to win one, I don't think it'll be something where they built it over three years. It'll be something where 
They bring back some good pieces. They get into the transfer portal, get a Nimhard, get an EK, get a Venters, and boom, it just happens. I think that can still happen for them and lots of other programs. But I do think that if it doesn't, Mark Few probably won't look back and regret because he doesn't look back and regret about things like that. He doesn't view the world that way. Um, but I think some people might look back and go, good, we should have got that done then. And that we didn't get it done then. It's going to be hard to get it done now. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's a practical way of looking at it. And Gonzaga has also made a habit of um, really blowing past the casuals is ex- expectations for them. And maybe that'll happen again this season for those that, you know, follow more intently and i'm talking about uh media in particular there because they will not be projected as a preseason top 10 team and i do think i do think that's that's fair on balance um let me run through this non-con schedule it's not done gonzaga because it plays in the wcc and because the wcc is yes a 16 game league schedule it gives the bulldogs more leeway to schedule ambitiously in the non-conference and um they may or may not have at least one more notable non-con game to put on here. If not, that wouldn't be terribly surprising. Um, the gimmies that we know about are they're going to play against Yale to open the season. They've got a game against Mississippi Valley State in December, and they've got a game at Washington on December 9th. I'm kidding, Huskies fans. I'm just kidding. Here are the notable games. Maui, uh, big time field. Kansas, Purdue, Cuse, Marquette, UCLA, Tennessee, Chaminade, the Zags are there. So they'll get three games. And while it's conceivable, maybe that, you know, things go nuts and they wind up getting Chaminade. We've got, we've walked through the bracket previously. They'll almost certainly be playing three power conference teams and they need that. Then they will play against USC in Vegas on December 2nd. Um, it now remains to be seen whether or not that game will or will not include Bronny James, but Isaiah Collier is the number one player per 247 in the class of 2023. He could be the best freshman in the country next season. Zags get that on a neutral. They will play at Washington on December 9th, so that's obviously notable. They'll play against UConn in Seattle in a two-year series that's been agreed to. They've got a game at Kentucky. Oh, by the way, I blew past that one. They've got a game at Kentucky earlier in the non-con slate. That's a big one at Rupp Arena. And then they're going to play at home against San Diego State in addition to playing a 16-game WCC schedule. So to recap, you got Maui and a slew, a slew, I tell you, of, of, of second weekend minimum NCAA tournament type teams in that event. USC could be a top 20 team. That game is in Vegas at Washington and a desperate year for Mike Hopkins and that staff. And they've got a couple of big time transfers. UConn in Seattle. At Kentucky, home versus San Diego State. Gonzaga always beats up this non-con. This season is no different. That in combo with the WCC. I'm going to set the over-under. Gary Parrish. I'm setting the over-under for Gonzaga in the regular season. 31 games. I'm going to set it at 25.5 wins. Are you going over or under? I'm flying right over. Yeah. The Bulldogs don't fly. Yes, they do. Yeah, no. you have to throw. Them By the way, bit. my guy, you, you know what? If you are listening to this podcast right now and you're not one that's prone to go to the YouTube channel, I'm going to implore you to do that because Parrish is rocking something, something between a cutoff and a typical T-shirt. He's got this Guns N' Roses shirt on and the sleeves end like three inches past the shoulder. What is that? I don't know. I can't remember seeing a shirt that had sleeves that short before. You think it's just to show off my guns? Well, can you show off your roses? <laughs> okay. Do I look strong? Sure. Yeah, yeah. We'll go with that. I'm flying straight over 26. You are? Yeah. I'm going to go three non-league losses. One in Maui. Let's say one at Kentucky. One somewhere else. Wish mm-hmm. they didn't have to go to Kentucky's campus. Wish they could just play in downtown Lexington or something, you know? Yeah, I hear you. Um, and then one somewhere else. And then I'll go two WCC losses. That gets me at five. 31 minus five is 26. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 26. That's fine. I don't see what the issue is. Well, thirty. It took me longer than it should have. Done. Yeah, I mean, it did. That was that was embarrassing. But thirty-one we, we, minus five is twenty-six. 
I thought you'd go under here because of where you had him in your preseason poll. Uh, I will go under. I will go 25 and six. Um, mark me down for two league losses. And I think the, I say they get picked off. I'll say they get picked off four times in non-league. So, or some way, some way, somehow they're getting to but 20 going is, under again, going under again. Not, You're I'm, not going to have any friends. I'm it's going to be me and I'm me. All right. Who is all going to be at my table at the final four? You've, it's going to be lost, me. lost count. Some friend. It's are. me and dusty may Shaka smart. Um, Scott drew, of course. And who else was going to be? Oh, Dan Hurley with his hat backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Greg McDermott. 25 and John six is pretty optimistic for this Gonzaga team. And and yet all not that unrealistic whatsoever. Twenty six and five. Uh, sorry for assuming the team that wins listen, a, I'm not more games than everybody else every, every year. On every it's, single it's sorry for assuming they're going to win a lot of games again. I apologize for assuming yeah, Gonzaga is going to win a lot of games. They won twenty six last season with Drew Timmy on the roster. So that's what I'm saying. They you got the team just as good this season as it was last season when it was the best offense in the country. Different schedules. Okay. League gets easier. No BYU. No, BYU is correct. Yeah, League gets easier. Only one other top 100 team. Plus, yeah. they just enrolled the preseason Mountain West Conference Player of the Year from last year. I don't know if you heard. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. You don't believe in Graham E.K.? I think he's got a chance. You didn't sit in studio till 2 o'clock in the morning watching Wyoming games uh, two years ago. I did. Yeah. Who was I the did. other player for Wyoming? Oh, uh, Maldonado. What was his first name? Yeah. Hunter. There we go. Yeah. Come let's on, on. Casey. What, let's go out on it, a high wasn't note. Wasn't there a Maldonado in baseball? Casey Maldonado? You're the baseball guy. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a baseball guy anymore. I hate baseball now. <laughs> <laughs> the Mets team. Your team is atrocious. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> it is awful. It is worse. It's the anti Gonzaga, actually. It is worse than North Carolina missing the NCAA tournament. After it really, it, honestly, it might be. It might they be. have the highest payroll in the history of Major League Baseball, and they are selling. They were selling in July. Uh, let's let's do it. Let's do a, a, a temperature check on the New York. I couldn't tell you the record. Where are they at right now? New York Mets, fifty and fifty-five, Four fourth in the NL East. Yeah. You hate to see it. Yeah, they're terrible. They are. They are stinky. They stink. I hate baseball. Anyway, the Maldonado. Steel Venters and Dusty Stromer. Yep. I wish they'd have got Hunter Maldonado too, you know? I think one cowboy might be enough. Speak for yourself. Is that a podcast? Are we done? That's done. Let's go. <laughs> okay. okay, let's go. Let's get out of here. Look at that, though. <sighs> need, to get a good, need to get a good filter on that. <laughs> You ever see those? He's flex. If you're listening, he's flexing his right body. You ever see those women on Instagram, and you're like, "Man, she's that's really pretty." That. And then you see them in person, and you're like, "Man, that's not what she looks like on Instagram." Nope, because I don't stalk people on Instagram. What? What do you even have Instagram for? Okay. And, and so they, what you, what you learn is they have filters. I need a filter for my bicep. I think you're doing just fine. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Huck. Shouts to Larnell. That's Thank you guys once again. For watching, listening to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe. Anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, more of us than there are of them. That should be reflected in the comments. Go do that. And then on Friday, guess what we're going to have for you? Another episode of the Summer Shoot Around. That one will be on Kelvin Sampson's Houston Cougars. Talk to you again real soon. Till then, take care. Bye. Bye.